All right, so it's nine o'clock. I guess I should, I'm gonna start now. Um, so thanks first of all for having me. I hope everyone can hear me. I apologize for my disheveled look a little bit. Uh, it's nice to be talking some ENT stuff as opposed to my current day job, which is an ICU resident, which is less fun than ENT. Um, and so what I'm going to be talking about today is just a little bit about resident education, uh, surgical education, and a little bit different than probably some of the talks that uh, you guys have been having. Uh, but really my main objective, so these are my disclosures here. Um, and my main objective with the talk is really to talk about the evolving landscape of surgical education and really why, why I think this is so useful, one of the many reasons I think this is so useful is because it allows us to interact with, you know, groups and uh, colleagues that maybe we don't get a chance to interact with all that often based on geography and uh, other uh, issues like that. But, you know, one of the things for me that this whole experience with COVID has, has kind of shown and, and, and proven true is the idea that um, it's going to kind of change how we feel about healthcare in general and healthcare practice and training practices and what we've shown over the last month or so and what I think we're going to continue to show here is the idea that uh, we shouldn't just kind of accept long-standing practices of how things are done and just do things in traditional ways just because they've been done for so long. We have to sort of think outside the box and what we've seen over the last month or so is how quickly things can change and how quickly we have the ability to adapt. So I think that we should use that experience and use the lessons that we've learned over the last month to apply that to many different areas of our specialty, many different areas of healthcare. And what I'm going to do today is just, uh, you know, is gonna go through some slides in terms of some of the problems that we've addressed um, within our institution, within our practice. Um, one of my roles here besides, you know, just as a little background to myself, I'm a generalist here at Montefiore. Um, which is Albert Einstein in New York. And um, one of my other roles I spend much of my time doing is as one of the directors for our innovation center here at, the, at, at our institution, as well as being a co-director of a biodesign and digital health fellowship in which we try to develop new technology and different platforms to apply to different areas of medicine to help us uh, you know, essentially keep things moving forward um, with evolving technology. And you know, my, my main objective with this talk is to try to create, generate some discussion and some ideas of, uh, from the group um, in terms of how we could take some individual ideas that we may all have and apply them uh, going forward and, you know, hopefully collaborate uh, with each other uh, interinstitutionally and uh, also maybe generate some ideas that you could bring to your own institution and uh, think about how we can, how we can keep things moving forward. So these are, you know, again, this is a common slide just showing some of the common characteristics of uh, the healthcare system as it currently is. Um, we all know it's very expensive. It's activity-based, fragmented, uncoordinated. It's uh, oftentimes very insular within our own institutions, difficult to access, inefficient, ineffective. These are all kind of terms that we hear all the time when we talk about healthcare, and there's a widespread demand for improvement in general. Um, I always like to show this slide, you know, whenever I'm giving a talk about something like this, because it's a book that really had an impact on my life. Uh, I would highly recommend it to everybody uh, who is listening. Um, it's called The Innovator's Dilemma. It's written by Clayton Christensen. And, and you know, the, the main takeaway for me from this book is the idea that great companies also often fail for doing the right things. And what this means is that people often they get very comfortable in their setting, get very comfortable in their current practices and don't adapt or make changes because they think, uh, because what they're doing is working in the current environment. But what they're not accounting for is that, you know, in a couple of years down the road, five years, 10 years, whatever it is, things will change. And they, you know, we need to be thinking what's going to be and what's going to be available to us in five and 10 years. And we need to make, make those changes now so that we can uh, adapt when the, when the time is appropriate. We shouldn't be staying stagnant and being comfortable with what we're doing, we should always be adapting and always thinking about the future and how we can make things better. So, you know, steps to innovation, you know, what is innovation? It's curiosity, it's discovery, invention, innovation. Um, it has to be unique, not just new. We don't want, you know, oftentimes, especially in academic practices, we often get stuck in the idea of, 
you know, doing things just for the sake of academia and, ac and academic practice. And so we, you know, our ideas are often plentiful, but not necessarily unique and not necessarily things that are going to keep things moving uh, forward. They have to be definably valuable. And, you know, again, they have to be worthy of exchange. They have to be worthy of your time. They have to be worthy of any money that's going to be uh, raised, whether it's uh, grant money, institutional money, other type of money, and also, of course, with the effort of yourself and other people as well. And, you know, when we talk about healthcare and healthcare providers, all these, you know, these big four uh, components all come together. Access, you know, you obviously need access to healthcare. Uh, cost, we need to keep it, uh, you know, cost efficient. Obviously, quality is the most important part and connectivity and culture, making sure that we are keeping it patient focused. We're integrating all the data that we have. We're improving things based on that data. We're making sure that the right people are overseeing that data and make sure that the right people are, are monitoring that. And that often is, you know, you need a physician leadership group and teamwork, systems thinking, learning organization. All of these things are important when we're coming, when we're talking about connectivity and culture. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to kind of present four or three different problems that, you know, amongst the, the, the many that we try to work on within our group um, that we've identified and some of the solutions ranging from very simple solutions that I'm sure you all have in the institutions that you are currently in um, to some more advanced solutions that we're working on. And again, the idea here is not, you know, the slides are, you know, obviously we'll go through the slides, but it's less important to see what we are doing and more important to, you know, the, the emphasis for me is kind of generating thought process and, and uh, collaboration and ideas uh, that we could all kind of work together. Um, so obviously feel free, obviously with this, in this, in this uh, environment, it's difficult to go back and forth to the Q&A, but I will certainly leave time at the end to uh, generate discussion. And I certainly hope that everyone on the call uh, you know, we get some ideas in terms of how to move things forward, ideas that in terms of how to improve training, how to improve residency training, how to improve surgical training, um, how to improve the healthcare environment in general. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll present some of the problems, some of the ways we thought about the problems, some of the solutions we came up with. And again, hope, with the hope being that at the end we can generate some discussion of uh, new problems and new solutions that we can, that we can come up with. So, Obviously, this is one of the problems that we're currently uh, dealing with in our training environment today. You know, previous generations, we've all heard, uh, you know, the, the stories of, of those who trained 20, 30 years ago, where they were working 120 hour plus weeks. Um, there was less concern with litigation. There was this idea that the surgeon is always right, and the surgeons had complete autonomy. In our current system, we have a system where uh, we obviously have the 80 hour work week limit. Um, there's significant concern for medical legal repercussion. Uh, we live in an environment now where the doctor in general, you know, maybe the, the, our current situation with COVID may be changing this a little bit, but I fear that as soon as things settle down, uh, we'll go right back to the old environment where the doctor is never right. You know, we have Dr. Google and all sorts of other authorities now that, that run everything. And, and there is this idea, especially in academic medicine, that Big Brother is always watching, that you're always being you know, there's a lot of data points out there that we are that are being generated and we are being judged based on those data points. And what that leads to, obviously, in previous generations, there's an argument to be made that it was more condu conducive for training and current system is less conducive for training. So, our, you know, that was a problem we're dealing with that, that we dealt with and we need to come up with so, sort of alternative solutions to increase our hands-on training. And for us, that was a, creating an, intro, uh, an introduction to ORL boot camp for our ORL interns. And, uh, you know, for us, that meant nine weekly sessions during the summer of our, their PGY one year, um, and three weekly sessions during the final three weeks of their PGY one year, with a focus on airway management, common console, soft tissue cores, proper use of and handling of equipment, and logistics. Uh, these are just some pictures from our boot camp here, um, showing our residents, the, you know, in our a simulation center dealing with everything from adult to pediatric uh, issues and you know again putting putting them through a pretty comprehensive and extensive boot camp over the course of 12 weeks of their intern year and then we try to extend it into their second year and uh, as we go forward try to make uh, create some more advanced simulations for our senior residents to do uh, in a more interdisciplinary way with other departments but you know again as I'm sure many of you have been to uh, some sort of boot camp 
um, in your own institutions, you, you understand what the idea of boot camp is and you understand what the idea of simulation in general, which is becoming more common amongst uh, residency programs uh, universally. So one of the big problems and one of the big issues with simulation in general is how do we assess it? Um, how do we assess the experience in general? How do we assess skills acquisition? This is a big challenge because, you know, especially in specialty like ours, where we're a very small specialty, we don't have big numbers in terms of uh, trainings and trainees. Um, you know, it's difficult to get significant uh, data that shows that these boot camps or simulation in general are making is making a big difference. So of course we can always use Likert surveys and get some subjective feedback. And this is, you know, this is you know very effective in terms of uh, rating uh, experience and and getting to see how people feel about the overall experience. But one of the issues when we are dealing with you know subjective feedback, especially when it's coming from an attending run course to residents, is you know, you know the, is the data real? Right? Are people just putting down sevens and sixes just because it's easy and they don't want to offend anybody or are they truly giving you honest feedback? So, you know, we could all pat ourselves on the back when we're ever running any sort of course and tell us that this is, that we're doing the right thing, but it's, you know, we want to make sure we have good objective uh, feedback that people are being honest about. So, you know, one of the things that we do all the time uh, with in our boot camp is, uh, you know, we try to debrief and to extensive debriefs um, you know, we talk about, you know, what worked, what didn't work. You know, we will always talk about at the initial debriefing, the faculty involved will always talk about uh, what we thought did not work, you know, because that's always able to generate some discussion from the trainees in terms of uh, what they thought didn't work. You know, if, you, if you're open and honest about what you think works and doesn't work, you'll get uh, more honest responses from um, your attendees and your trainees. So, um, and based off that, feedback, we, you know, we were able to make a lot of changes to, to our boot camp. And then, you know, again, it was very important for us to also uh, create some score sheets to uh, obtain some real objective data to see if these boot camps were working and to see not just from a experiential uh, perspective if they were working, but from a technical perspective if they were working. We wanted to see if some of these uh, kind of basic ORL skills that we were teaching throughout this boot camp uh, you know, we're, we're being taught and we're, and we're having benefit from the boot camp itself in terms of teaching these skills. So we set up a score sheet for these three different uh, technical procedures uh, that we thought that we were kind of going over multiple times over the course of the boot camp. And we we're able to have, uh, you know, objective and unbiased raters uh, rate the performance. We videotaped everything and we were able to rate the performance. And this is what we found. Uh, you know, again, not surprising that we found uh, that there was improvement uh, in these individual technical skills that people were performing from for that, that they were able to learn in the boot camp as compared to learners who didn't have the boot camp. Now, again, um, you know, we expect that people are going to get better over time with all of these skills just as is, but you know, this is also a way for people to go into their PGY2 uh, year feeling as though they're more prepared to be taking, you know, in-house call and seeing patients in the emergency room and, and on the floors and doing these consults with these technical skills needed to uh, and be able to, to complete them and do them. So that, you know, that to me is a, is a basic problem with a basic solution and, and a pretty easily applicable solution. But you know, we want to kind of think beyond the basic problems and and the easy and, and, and the easy solutions. We want to take it to the next level. We want to really kind of disrupt how we're thinking about things and and think about how we can do things even better than we're currently doing. So, you know, one of the issues that I've often thought about is, you know, we we put people through residency, we put people through training, and people operate a ton, and they and then we send them on their way, and we, you know, expect that they know are comfortable in, in, in what they're doing and are comfortable in the procedures that they're doing and the steps that they're doing. But we don't really have an objective way of knowing if people are actually comfortable and ready to do the procedures. And, and oftentimes just the environment that we're in, in healthcare, we don't have an environment that is as open and honest as it should be. And our trainees are not always open and honest in terms of telling us, hey, we are not necessarily ready to do this. We need more training because they don't want to, you know, there's this culture fear in general uh, 
amongst residents uh, in terms of doing that, even in our specialty, which is a very friendly and um, collegial type environment. I think there is there is that invite there that environment of uh, embarrassment where we're not sure that we you know we can speak up if we feel like we're not ready for something. So there's this question of are we actually ready to perform procedures on live patients that we are that we're doing? You know, even when we're doing we have these simulations, um, are we ready to do the actual procedures? So one of the areas that we that we looked at was with uh, fine needle aspiration for ultrasound guided thyroid biopsies. Um, you know, this is a procedure that we do in the office all the time, but it's one of the things that, you know, again, you're doing it on awake patients. It's different than obviously doing it in the operating room. Um, and so we really, you know, for people to be able to do it, they need to be ready to do it. You don't want to walk into a patient room and appear anxious and like you don't know what you're doing. So we want to make sure that we have enough training leading up to that experience that when you actually walk into the patient room and are asked to do these procedures, we are ready to do. So it obviously requires fine, precise technique and the ability to accurately identify vital structures on the ultrasound. Now there are current um, phantom, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> there are current phantom models out there, but they're expensive, they're difficult to get. And so our goal was to create a, a model that uh, was cheaper, easily rep replicable, and uh, accurate in terms of the anatomy and the ability to find motor skills needed to do the procedure. So, you know, again, this was our objective. We worked with, it, with uh, this is my partner in the lab. And so we were able to use some basic store-bought items to, to create this. And what you're saying, I apologize that, you know, the video that we have of this is not very good, but um, this is our phantom that we created here. Um, we used a box of nuts to uh, create the head, um, shoulder pads to simulate the shoulders, and a box, just a general uh, brown box to simulate the torso. Um, and then we were able to find, again, store-bought materials that actually were really, uh, really showed up very nicely on the ultrasound. And so we have a, we spam to simulate the thyroid, blueberries. Uh, to simulate hyperechoic nodules because they are hyperechoic on ultrasound, peas to simulate hypoechoic nodules, um, and then balloons filled with food coloring to stimulate to simulate the vessels. Um, and then we found gelatin to be a, a, a good product to simulate the soft tissue of the neck. And we put a little blue check over the area of the neck so that we can't see directly into our phantom. Um, and what you're seeing here is just us performing the simulations um, with the ultrasound visualization. Um, again, on the thyroid and the um, ultrasound itself, the trachea is represented by the wire loom, which is the red star, the hypochoic nodules by the peas, which is the red arrow, and the thyroid by the spam, which is the green arrow. And again, in a little bit of a closer up shot, uh, same thing here. And you can see it's actually, you know, really relatively accurate of what you're, you know, and, and looks similar to what you're looking at when you're looking at a uh, ultrasound of a thyroid and you're doing an ultrasound guided thyroid biopsy. And so again, we wanted some data. So we, uh, we, as for face and construct validity of this, and we looked at medical students. Uh, we looked at our novice of laryngology residents and endocrine fellows who performed less than five thyroid FNAs on live patients. And then uh, we used our uh, ENT and endocrine fellows who had performed many thyroid FNAs. Um, they were, again, we recruited all these participants. They received a standardized curriculum uh, where they were taught the indications, complications, and techniques of the ultrasound, uh, and then shown a demonstration of the simulation. Uh, we had them run through six trials each and then analyze the score. And again, we created a score sheet uh, looking at different components of what we want to see for an ultrasound guided thyroid biopsy um, and scored each uh, participant based on the score sheet. And these are our statistics, you know, again, not surprising. And this is what you want to see when you're doing a face and construct that val uh, validation study where our real novices who had never, who really were not comfortable with the anatomy and never done this procedure before um, performed quite poorly, but improved over the course of their six trials. Um, our experts performed as you would expect, which was expertly and very well. And then our novices who had, were somewhat comfortable with the anatomy and understood conceptually what they needed to do started off kind of in the mid range. And by the time that they were done, uh, they were pretty much on par with our experts. And again, this is this is ideally what you want to see when you're studying, um, when you're doing a face and construct validation study for, um, for these types of simulations. And again, just looking at the data in more granular detail, 
uh, trial by trial, you see that each group, uh, well, the medical student and the uh, novice group, both improved as they were as they went through their six trials in the expert group. You know, again, there wasn't a whole lot of room for improvement, but again, what you want to see when you're going through these uh, face and construct validation studies. And then again, it's always important to get the subjective feedback, which we were able to obtain, uh, which showed, uh, you know, again, most people felt that this was a beneficial for, for learning thyroid FNA. Um, you know, one thing that we've learned for sure with simulation and, and creating these types of uh, low fidelity, low cost type of simulators, that it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be exactly as it is in real life. You're not dealing with live patients. You're not dealing with blood coming at you. You're not dealing with, you know, real anatomy. Um, but most people agreed that the visualization was realistic um, and, and realistic enough to, to be helpful for training purposes. And then, you know, most importantly for me was the idea that um, you want this haptic feedback of the needle penetration was realistic and it's hard to create perfectly, but, you know, most people felt that it was, uh, you know, close to reality. Um, if not perfect, um, and, and this is, I think, an important component because you want to feel like, even though you might not be, you know, doing it on a live patient, you do want to feel that uh, that there's some sort of realistic component in terms of the touch and feel component of it. And maybe most importantly is that you know that our co our cost cost of the initial model was forty nine dollars, and our cost per model was you know every model after that was two dollars eighteen cents, which means that this is very easily replicable and um, easy to reuse. And you can do this many, many times um, without having to spend significant money. And I think when it comes to creating uh, learning modules and task trainers to help us uh, learn different surgical techniques or different uh, technical procedures, I think that this is one of the most important things that cannot be emphasized enough, which is that you really have to think about cost because, you know, again, Hospitals don't have a lot of money, departments don't have a lot of money, and we have to you know, make sure that if we want to do this and not just make it an academic exercise, but something that we could use over and over and over again, uh, we have to make it cost efficient. So, you know, this is a second example of that, which is sinonasal endoscopy. Um, with the, you know, we all know that the, when we initially start doing sinus surgery and start doing endoscopy in general, it's always easier than it looks. There is a learning curve. It's pretty steep and you learn pretty quickly, but there is definitely a learning curve. I mean, just throw a fourth year medical student in and ask them to start doing endoscopy and you'll, you'll, you'll quickly remember how steep that learning curve is and how it does look much easier than it actually is. Um, but the problem with sinonasal endoscopy is that simple mistake could often lead to serious complications, right? I mean, you are, when we're doing sinus surgery, if you hit the wrong thing with the wrong instrument, all of a sudden you could be, you know, you could end up in the eye, you can end up in the brain. And these are major problems and even less serious complications, but you don't want the beginning of a sinus case to be where you know, someone is mucking around in there and all of a sudden there's lots of bleeding. Um, and makes certainly makes the rest of the case much more difficult. So we want some sort of learning ability and some sort of training prior to actually getting into the operating room or doing these endoscopies in the office. Um, this was, you know, this picture here is, a, is one of our high fidelity simulators that we had. This was built by Lockheed Martin. Um, but the problem with high fidelity simulators, while they're very nice and, you know, getting better by the year, they're often inaccessible, they're costly, and the haptics is, you know, are still not perfect. So to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on a simulator for training purposes and then not, not have it be perfect is, you know, certainly not ideal. And so we wanted to kind of come up with a solution that allowed us to address this problem in a less costly uh, way. And so we started playing around again with some store-bought materials and we, had, we were able to see that when you cut a hole into a bell pepper, uh, the inside looked actually somewhat similar to the inside of a nose. And it also had a lot of the anatomic features um, of, of the inside of a nose and the partitions and the septae that we are often dealing with in the sinus cavity. So uh, we felt that this was a, a certainly a good uh, learning device that could be used to help us teach uh, sinonasal endoscopy. And I hope these videos will play. Let's see here. So these are just some of our, I'm going to play this here. So what I'm showing here is just a video of, you know, these are some of the septae that exist within the bell pepper here. And 
if you look inside of a bell pepper, you actually have this uncinate looking septae that most bell peppers will have. And it's, a, it's actually a pretty nice tool to use to practice our uncinectomy. Again, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but certainly good enough to get some basic skills in terms of bimanual uh, work in the septum, in the sinuses, and uh, you know that that touch and feel of taking down a structure within the the nasal cavity. Bring this back up. Oh, I'm sorry. The uh, challenges of Zoom technology are I have not yet perfected totally. Uh, let me show you one more video here. play and this is one of our medical students doing an injection and this is a little piece of neoprene that we put inside the bell pepper that's the material that you use on wetsuits and it blanches real nice when you get it into the right plane so it's a it's a, it's a neat little Again, no more videos, I promise. But it's a neat little trick to practice your injection skills. And again, we created this uh, extensive rating uh, tool uh, for our uh, independent raters to rate uh, our participants. We again created a study where we used uh, novice level, level medical students, residents, and attending uh, physicians who perform a, a extensive amount of sinus surgery. Uh, we had them do the backbiter task, remove the partition um, within the bell pepper, and then the targeted injection with the spinal needle. And then again, we had uh, a grading system that was uh, performed by our trained rhinologist and a feedback and a, a feedback questionnaire as well. And again, you know, again, we saw what we expected to see, which is that the uh, medical students were by far the worst in terms of their economy of motion, their performance overall. Uh, the attendings were better than the residents. So that was, you know, in a way that was not necessarily uh, significant, but trending towards significance. Um, and the attendings have higher mean scores for performance and economy of motion that, than residents in general, while the residents and the attendings were both significantly better than the medical students, which again is what you wanna see when you're doing face and construct validation studies. And the really nice thing about creating such a low cost, uh, low fidelity device is that it's really easily uh, translatable in, in many different ways. And one of the things that we've done is that we've now sent our protocol over to multiple different countries that don't necessarily have access to high fidelity training and are looking for easier ways to, to train residents and train physicians. And this is just a picture um, in Vietnam of our uh, of a program that was using our you know our bell pepper model to train some of their uh, to train some of their residents. So now we're going to move on to you know our, our last problem that I'm going to discuss, which is you know again a little bit of a more uh, technologically advanced solution that we created, um, but again addresses a, a simple problem that we all often think about. Um, and so, you know, we have 51 million surgeries performed annually in the U.S. 40% uh, of total healthcare spending is spent on surgery, um, and 6.8% of the U.S. gross uh, domestic product is directly or indirectly related to what a surgeon does inside the operating room. And it really begs this question, are we really sure our trainees are ready, ready to operate autonomously? And, you know, again, we have the best trained residents anywhere. These, you know, all of you are, the, you know, the best of the best. And you're all very familiar with the ACGME uh, login site where you have to log your cases and we're able to identify if you've fulfilled all of your key indicator cases and how many, you know, your numbers in general to see how you stack up against other residents from across the country and to identify subjectively that you are ready to move on and, and operate and become attendings and um, have privileges wherever you go. 
And we have a lot of companies right now and a lot of data that's, that is fed back to us in, in terms of, you know, what we're doing and, you know, from a timing, cost, all those different perspectives. But we don't have, you know, really have any data in terms of showing us how we're doing the surgeries, um, if best practices are being used. We don't really have a way of identifying, you know, best practices and best teaching practices. And there's, a, you know, again, this doesn't just apply to residency. This applies to all of us who are out in practice right now, which is that from the time a surgeon finishes training to the time that they retire, no one's ever going to watch them operate again, right? So we all know that, you know, we all have individual skills that some, some things we're better at, some things we're worse at. Um, but when we come out of residency, it's kind of a, the Wild West where we're just kind of allowed to, we're given privileges, we apply for privileges, the, the individual chair people within the departments or bosses within the hospitals or within your private practice, you know, you apply for certain privileges, you're given them, and then you're allowed to kind of go out and do whatever you want to do. And that, that just doesn't seem really efficient or really effective. And quite honestly, it could sometimes be uh, dangerous. So the question is, how do we improve both the residents and attendings? How do we improve our surgical skills? How do we get better? How does the hospital make sure its surgeons are operating as efficiently as possible? And how do surgeon accreditation authorities know that residents are really ready to begin practicing? And again, from a resident education perspective, we currently have 17 milestones, which I'm sure you're all aware of. We have the ACGME, ACGME log that everyone has to fill out. We, uh, these, I, these things are really pretty subjective and variable. Um, there's minimal oversight. I mean, we all try to do the best that we can within the realms of our own departments, but from an oversight perspective, it's just kind of checking check boxes and making sure that you're hitting milestones and that you're you're not too many standard deviations away from the norm. And then you know on you go and and you know we send everyone on their way to to their future careers, which is important. But it's also important that we make sure that everyone feels ready and is actually ready to go do that. Um, and then the training is very surgeon specific. So what you know you do in your individual institution may be very different than what we do in our institution. And obviously everyone has different protocols and the way that they do things. And there is certainly room for some variability in terms of how people are doing things, but there should be best practices, right? We should be able to identify best practices in terms of performance, outcomes, cost, all of those things that we should be able to, to identify um, so that we are incorporating best practices into all of our practice and you know learning from each other uh, and, and you know standard is you know we have a very poor um, standardization uh, protocol across the board right I mean we, we, we don't we're not very good at communicating our flight plan to the rest of the OR team to our residents um, there's you know we don't have a whole lot of incentivization to follow a standard protocol and you know we all train very differently, so when we come out, we're pretty stubborn in terms of this is the way I learned, this is the way I want to do things, and it's the my way problem. This is how I do things, and this is how I've always done things, and I'm not going to change uh, how I always do things. And so you know we you know and I you know full disclosure here, most of the data that I'll present over the next couple of slides is in general surgery, um, and the reason for that is because you know when we're trying to collect data in this area. Uh, we need big numbers to show that there is significant difference. And, you know, again, in our specialty, which is much smaller, uh, those numbers would take years and years to, to kind of build up. So general surgery is, you know, is a better avenue to go down because obviously they're doing a lot more cases and there's, you know, a lot more variability and more surgeons in general. So when we did collect the data within our institutions, we asked them, our, our general surgeons, to describe the steps of a colostectomy. Um, and we got, you know, from 10 different surgeons, we got 10 different protocols. And this was universal across all specialties that we asked um, to submit surveys and protocols. And you can see there's a wide range when it comes to, to protocols and each green or white dot represents a different surgeon and different, proto and different protocols. Um, and what we're seeing here is that there's a wide variability in terms of how many procedures they do, how long it takes them to do the individual procedures, and also wide variability in terms of how much each of these uh, procedures is costing. So, and these are all important factors when you get out into practice because, you know, again, if you are 
the person who's doing a 49 minute cholecystectomy at an average cost of $770 or an average total cost of uh, $3,000. It's very different than the person who's out and doing, you know, an average 86 minute cholecystectomy at an average cost of $8,000 because, you know, you, you will be, you know, the hospital will ask why that is your chairperson will ask why that, is, why that is. Um, if you're in private practice, you know, again, all of these things are, are, are important factors to, to look at. So there, this is important information to have, and it's important to see how much variability there is among surgeons in terms of how they do things and, you know, how long they take and how much, how, how costly those individual procedures are. And when we look at quality in surgery in general, you know, this is you know, complicated science behind the idea of Six Sigma, which is a standardization protocol that has been uh, applied in many different companies. But the bottom line is that if the aviation industry operated as at the same six, uh, same sigma level, which is you know again looking at variability in in terms of procedures, there would be 20 commercial plane crashes each day, and that's a very dramatic fact that you know again kind of drives the point home. And obviously, there's multiple factors that that have to be taken into account for that. But it, you know, it does show that we are certainly not as good as we can be when it comes to lack of standardization and uh, generating protocols and best practices. And you know, again, there, there is data out there that shows that in one error is made within every four cases that we perform as surgeons. And that's just way too much. You know, again, we cannot, we should not just accept the fact that, you know, our patient's anatomy is different. We have more challenging patients. We have, you know, all the excuses we sometimes like to use uh, when we're talking about complications. And sometimes these are not major complications, but minor complications. But we shouldn't just accept the fact that um, we're making one error in every four cases that we're doing. And again, you know, how do, how do these surgeons vary in the way they perform the operation? Um, you know, when we look at the data, the reality is that we really don't know. You know, we, you know, unless you get people to kind of write down their protocols. We see all this variation, um, but we just, you know, to this point, we really don't know why surgeons differ in terms of uh, how they do things. So currently there's no simple way for surgeons to achieve the following. We, you, we don't have a way where we communicate the surgical plan to the rest of the team. We don't really have a way, you know, again, we, we try our best to communicate how we do things to our residents, but, you know, the reality is a lot of it is, you know, sight and see, right? We, we get into the operating room, people see how we like to do our cases and that's how they learn. But we should really be uh, communicating more effectively with everyone, both our residents and the, our, our surgical teams in terms of how we're doing things so we can prepare and we can, you know, again, and we can alleviate some of the mistakes that we make. Uh, in addition, to, you know, we should, we should be communicating more um, so that our residents are more prepared to, to do the cases. They have a better understanding of what is expected of them. And so that they, when they're going to the operating room, they don't kind of, they don't have to learn on the fly, but they are prepared and ready to take the individual steps and do the critical portions of the case um, so that they feel like they're well-trained and feel like they're ready to, to operate autonomously when they come out of, uh, come out of residency. I'm a big baseball fan. So, you know, again, I, I always go back to, some other industries, but certainly in baseball, I, I find it amazing that in in something you know, in a game that is really that we play just for fun. There's so much data out there that we take into account when it comes to individual performance, and every individual player is rated on all of this data. You know, again, and there's more data that comes out every single year, and this is just an accepted part of baseball. But in healthcare, we really don't have that unless you're having major complications all the time, there's very little data out there that's gonna show us how we're performing and what we're doing and if we're doing it well. And so there's a bunch of solutions out there, telementoring, black box in the room, personal coaching, video analysis, but the reality is, and you know, we, and I'll talk about a, a solution that we created, but the reality is that there is no one solution that fits it all. Um, we have to identify what works best on an individual level and what works best for us uh, each, uh, again, on an individual level. So we created a, a platform uh, you know, again, where we, uh, we call it Sigma, um, where we had surgeons publish their protocols, um, the protocols displayed in the operating room as a communication assistant to the surgeon and the team. Um, at the end of each step, we have a voice activated system. So at the end of each step, 
Um, we could identify how long it took, the interruption time, the residence level of participation, the data is analyzed, benchmark, uh, and reports are generated and delivered back to our surgeons and our residents and the program directors. And we're able to keep the case log to see how both the surgeons and the residents are you know, accelerating and advancing and improving and identifying individual issues that we could work on an individual level with. And so this is a busy slide, but the area I really wanna point out that I think is, is most important here is from a resident training perspective is down here, which is the, you know, the, the average resident participation per step. What we wanna look at is uh, not just, again, how the individual surgeons are performing, but also if we are teaching, you know, if we're, we are fulfilling our obligation of teaching our residents um, how to operate, how to not just do you know, opening and closing of some of the more complex cases, but also the, the critical steps and making sure that they are, feel comfortable doing it and actually doing it. So to break that down a little further here, when we look at residents, you know, we're able to look at um, how many cases they've, they've done uh, of this particular procedure uh, and how break, broken down by individual surgeons and how many times they've operated with those individual surgeons. Um, we're able to identify, you know, which surgeons are allowing the residents to operate more, which are uh, which are allowing the operate surgeon the residents to operate less, and then we break it down even further, which is we go step by step through the protocols that the residents uh, that the surgeons have created, and we use this Weish model, which is down here, which has four four different levels, which is show and tell, active help, passive help, and supervision only, and again, it allows us to see on a step-by-step -step basis of that individual procedure, uh, which surgeon, which residents are not just comfortable seeing and watching individual steps and seeing and watching the surgeon perform individual steps, but advancing appropriately so that um, they are able to actually perform those individual steps um, mm -hmm. and so that when they are graduating residency and finishing residency, they are able to actually, you know, we could feel comfortable and they, and more importantly, they could feel comfortable that they are, going out ready to perform those procedures. You know, it's one thing to watch um, the attending dissect on the recurrent laryngeal nerve. It's another thing, obviously, to get that touch and feel of dissecting the recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, during thyroidectomy. And it, it's important that, that we're not just having people, you know, watch throughout their residency, but at some point, when appropriate, of course, they're doing these individual uh, steps. And then we're able to break it down even further here where we're able to identify micro competencies. So for us, cauterization, blunt dissection, clip placement, stuff like that. Uh, you know, again, here we're looking at um, general surgery. So we're looking at uh, cholecystectomy. But for us, um, all these individual steps and all these individual micro competencies of technical ability and technical procedures uh, are just as applicable where we're able to identify that individual residents are able to do all of these micro competencies and feel comfortable that they're able to do it. And we have a certain number that we identify for each procedure where we feel that if they've done that technical uh, procedure enough times and they're technically competent to do it. And so we're able to monitor as they go through their residency that they're doing this, you know, they're actively participating in these individual micro competencies enough. And again, you know, this is just a, a graph chart showing um, that uh, from a time perspective, how often and, and the residents are participating uh, in individual steps. Again, same thing there. So what have we found? So we, you know, we looked at several different procedures. You know, we looked at 140 laminectomies um, because we had, uh, we had a pretty big neurosurgery department over here. Um, and we had looked at five different surgeons who performed these laminectomies and we had three who had 75, greater than 75% resident participation, two with less than 25% resident participation. Um, our resident surveys corresponded with the data. Uh, um, and then, you know, again, in a very non-aggressive way, you know, these, all the surgeons met with the program director to discuss this. And one of the surgeons independently just looked at this data and agreed with the data and said, you know what, I'm just not comfortable allowing residents to operate on my patients and left for private practice, which again was a good decision for him and for the department. I mean, it just made sense. Um, and the other surgeon who was less than 25% participation, you know, recognized that she needed to be a little uh, less 
to, to allow the residents to be a little more hands-on and, and you know now a year later is at 67 percent resident participation and is and you know again and, and feedback from her is very happy that we've presented this data and allowed her to see where she herself could uh, improve as an educator um, you know again we looked at from a resident perspective um, and, and we found two resident outliers uh, when match first there's classmates classmates and you know again you know we don't want this you know it, this feels like a little bit like big brother is watching but that's not the purpose of it and so we try to do this in a in the least aggressive way possible but we have again the program director meet individually with the residents analyze their data and then identify specific areas you know and again oftentimes these are you know just if you're you know, one person could be really good working under the microscope, but not as skilled doing open head and neck surgery. It's the same thing in every specialty, right? So oftentimes we all have our individual skill sets um, that we, some things we're better at, some things we're worse at. And we wanna, you know, I think we all wanna learn and we all wanna get better and we all wanna have ways of improving. And so just by kind of identifying the areas where we struggle and then giving, creating some solutions uh, and, or creating some teaching opportunities where you know, you, you can partner up with somebody who is a little bit more skilled in that area. Um, you may be able to, it's very likely that you'll be able to improve yourself. So uh, just by setting up these individual technical skills training uh, programs for these people, um, and what we've seen now, the data is pretty much being finalized, and these two resident outliers are now on par with their classmates. And again, from an attending standpoint, uh, you know, we looked at 540 lap coles over a course of a year. There are four major complications uh, from three surgeons. All of them were common bile duct injuries. Um, and when we looked at the data, we found that all four were in situations where they were uh, greater than two standard deviations above the institution, institutional mean for steps, for the critical steps of that procedure in terms of their timing for that procedure. So we know that when people are struggling, they take longer to perform that, that step, and oftentimes their people are reluctant to ask for help. And so now we have a system in place where if, you know, if individual steps uh, of procedures where you're greater than two standard deviations above the norm in terms of time for that step, uh, we have a system that automatically kind of generates help and just, you know, again, in, in a non-aggressive way, but um, in, in a way where people who may not be comfortable asking for help or maybe embar too embarrassed to ask for help. Now it's an automatic system so that, you know, it, it's there for them if they need it. And, you know, when we analyzed the data over the following year, um, we only saw one common bile duct injury and uh, there was no call from help for help in, in that case. And so, you know, the value for doctors, again, is where we were able to learn where improvement is needed. We're able to share how you do it and create this, you know, again, we live in a digital world now and, you know, and for better or worse, uh, a world where, you know, again, data can pass from, from here to, to, you know, overseas within two seconds. And, you know, again, we could share information and share protocols and share best practices. And there's no reason not to do that. Um, it allows us to continue to improve as a surgeon um, it allows the entire team to know the operative plan. Um, we, we're able to incorporate intelligent analytics and accelerate our learning curve. And again, so the idea is that we want to embrace, but not just in, but uh, the embrace, but not accept the current climate, grow with technology, continue to ask questions and find solutions, and and strive to be as perfect as we can be. And I, you know, with that, I thank everybody for listening. Um, I hope there that this was useful and helpful and I'm certainly happy to take any questions and more importantly I'm happy to uh, you know hear any problems and solutions that people may have and you know whether it's here or um, down the road you know feel please feel free to reach out um, with some collaboration and with some ideas that you may have um, and uh, with that I'll turn it over thank you Thank you very much. All right, so I don't see any questions. Oh.